Des Moines, and all of central Iowa, welcome to Max World Live. Max World is your world. Every day we talk about the issues and topics that matter most to you. And as always, it's your voice we want to hear in Max World. So join the conversation by calling 515-244-0077. And now, here's the host of Max World Live, J. Michael McCoy. All right, good afternoon. Six and a half minutes past four o'clock on the second day of November in the Lord's year 2015. I'm Jay Michael McCoy. A lot of uh, a lot of exciting things happening around the world. Of course, the Royals won the World Series, um, and I guess that's a pretty big deal. They haven't done it since 85, and uh, apparently they've been improving a lot in the last few years. I'm not a baseball fan, but I know some Royals fans who are genuinely excited and think that they deserve it well and then that wor- particular world series in 85 i think was with the it, that was called the i-70 world series with st louis yes. and kansas city yes and i think there was a disputed call at first base in like the sixth game of that series that uh, a lot of people say the royals didn't really deserve that one. Oh, and so this one they really did yeah because they ab- obviously outplayed uh, the mets yeah because it was two to two well it was two to nothing two to nothing in favor of the Mets at the top of the ninth, and they tied it two to two, and then they went to the twelfth inning, and then I hit. I think they hit yeah. five runs five in the twelfth inning. The top of the yeah. I don't understand. I mean, I understand baseball. It's just it. I don't know. I have a hard time watching it. It's just so slow. All right, and congratulations to all you Hawkeye fans. You deserve it. Eight no, incredible. As a Nebraska fan, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I I think we're just trying to rebuild. I don't know. I don't have any idea. <laughs> I mean, we, we went into Purdue. We should have just whipped them, and they whipped us. There was like almost 80 points scored in that game. So who are the people blaming for this? Well, I don't know if there's anybody blaming. I think Nebraska realizes they've got a brand-new coach, and uh, um, he's a different kind of coach. I mean, uh, Bo uh, was just loud and boisterous and like that, and this guy's not that way. And I think there's some players who, A, are mad at the school because – their coach went away um and i don't know enough about the psychology of sports um i know that if for some reason i was dissatisfied with the people that own uh the network that i'm on i don't think i'd mail in the show bob we've been doing shows together for years and i i my guess is you've never seen me walk in and say i don't really care about today's show let's just get done with it nope never saw that no but i I don't know if you're an athlete and and do you take your coach away i mean good heavens Callahan had winning seat. What was he fired with a ten and three, I think, or a nine and four? I mean, it was an incredible season. But they got rid of Frank Solich the same way a few years earlier. I think Nebraska fans are spoiled. We're arrogant. We're pompous. We expect national teams like we had in the seventies, and it's not going to happen that way anymore. The SEC is too powerful. And plus, I would be willing. I here's something I'd be shocked at. I would be shocked if Nebraska was ever. Uh, compliant in some type of scandal in which players were being paid or something like that. I just don't think that happens at Nebraska. Now, maybe I'm naive, but I know this happens at other schools because they get caught for it. And a lot of them are the SEC schools. Plus, who wants to live in Nebraska in in uh, August, September, October, and November, and December when you can live in Florida or you can live in Alabama or California, you know, Frank? Just one little footnote I wanted to mention about the Kansas City Royals. As somebody who used to be an avid baseball fan back in the 80s, there was no team that I feared more than the Kansas City Royals playing at home in Kansas City. They had that artificial turf. They had a just a, a, a rabid crowd. And anything, uh, a, 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 a call at second base, anything would get – that team fired up and get the momentum going, and there was no team that, that, that the teams that I followed that I feared playing any, anybody else than the Kansas City Royals. Yeah, that was uh, – um, I, the only thing I remember about the Royals is I've been to the game. I've been, I've been to that stadium before, and I remember – who was the guy with the pine tar? George Brett. George Brett. Now, did he ever make it into the Hall of Fame? Uh, y- yes, I believe so. I yeah. All right. Um. Um, Ryan, we're getting a notice on Facebook that the live stream is not working. So you could check that out. All right. 
We didn't ask you, Rita, about if you like sports. I love sports. Are you are you a, a Royals fan? No, I'm a Twins fan. So you weren't happy about? Well, no, I well, guess I, no. Kansas City. Yeah, that was cool. They hadn't won a long time. I'm an underdog person. Always. Almost always. Almost. So so if the Twins won the pennant, you'd switch to another team. No, if they're playing the ten, uh, somebody the next year, I'd want everybody to have their chance. I see. Okay. Now I, I don't know. I don't follow baseball. How did the did the Twins even get in the playoffs? <laughs> I must have said something funny. Okay, no, 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 not really. And they're not playing in that big dome this year, right? Isn't that gone? Or I think there's some yeah something going on with that. They're going to tear it down. Seems yeah. like they just built it. But of course, you know, time flies when yeah, you're I don't, old. Yeah. I don't. I don't. Target follow this. Target Stadium is. I think Target yeah. something is their new stadium. Their well, that's where the stadium. Timberwolves played. Was at the Target Center. Well, they have a target field that the that the Minnesota Twins play. It's it's open air, natural grass field. Mm-hmm. Uh, the old Metropolitan uh, Dome or Metropolitan Stadium they used to play at is where the Ball of America sits now. Okay, uh, well, Herbert, Herbert Herbert Hoover. That was the um, Herbert Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey Dome. I that's tore down. I believe that's the one that's gone. All right. Boy, somebody's listening to us going, what a bunch of dumbbells. These guys don't know anything about sports. <laughs> That's no, for sure I don't. We, don't. we don't. We don't know at all. All right, Rita is here. And uh, uh, Rita uh, spent part of her life uh, uh, in chains, not literally, but it felt that way, with physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. And we're going to do something a little bit different because I want Rita to be real comfortable. Uh, we're going to let her read your testimony, and uh, if we can, we might step in and ask a question or stop you, and then after you're done, um, then we would certainly like to ask you some questions about it. That would be great. And if anybody has any questions, you can jump on the, the lines at 244-007 and, uh, or 0077 and ask uh, Rita any question you want. Now, um, it's 13 minutes past the hour. This break goes here for another few minutes and so we'll let you start now, and then uh, I'll, I'll let you know when there's a break coming up sure. that we have to stop. Sure, okay. Sounds great. Thank Go you ahead, so much Rita. for having me. You bet. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rita, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I'm a survivor of physical, sexual, emotional, and spiritual abuse. I struggle with codependence, isolation, and self-reliance. I was born in South Dakota to teen parents. Because of their economic, family, and social background, they gave me up for adoption. My birth was not an accident, and my life from day one was God-ordained in God's will. I have great respect for my birth parents for the love and courage they had for me by giving me up for adoption. The only request that was made was that I be adopted by Lutheran parents. No idea why. After 18 months in several foster homes, I was adopted by a young couple who couldn't have children of their own. They also had an adopted son who was three years old at the time of my arrival. My mother was an outgoing social butterfly who never knew an angel, a stranger, excuse me. She was a great hostess, classy, but yet down-to-earth mom. She loved to entertain. She was a very loyal, fierce friend and encourager and taught me how to love others unconditionally. There was not a day that passed by without her telling me verbally that she loved me. She insisted upon celebrating my homecoming birthday, March 3rd, every year, by calling me on the phone and saying, hello, darling. Did you know that we brought you home to us 18, 25, 30, 40 years ago? She did that every year until the year she died at age 76 of leukemia and Parkinson's disease. I expect that when we meet again in heaven, she'll probably hold out her arms to me and cheerfully say, Hi, darling, welcome home. Did you know that we brought you home to us so many years ago? My dad was a respected businessman in a small rural community. He was a hard worker, a great provider, and a firm but fair boss to his men at the local lumber yard. He was an example of the true American dream by starting work as a yard boy when he was 16 years old, taking time out to serve in Okinawa in World War II for four years, and then returning home to become manager of that same yard. He retired at age 72 as the president and co-owner of the company and also served on the state and national level of the Lumberman's Association. He worked for the same company for 56 years. We went to church every Sunday and appeared to be the perfect Lutheran family. Mom and dad were extremely active in the church, serving as Sunday school teachers, youth group leaders, and church council members. I sang in the children's choir, attended church camp every year. 
Very typical church-going kid, like almost every other kid in the two rural towns I grew up in. Even at a young age, I loved God and knew him as my protector who wanted me un- loved me unconditionally. I grew up wanting to become a Catholic priest. <laughs> Being a serious tomboy, a nun was out of the question because they had to wear a dress of those funny hat thingies. My hat of choice was the cowboy hat. And it didn't make any set difference to me that I was Lutheran and not Catholic. As far as I was concerned, I'd go live at Blue Cloud Abbey, which was a monastery about 15 miles away from my home. And that was my lifelong career and dream. Inside our home, Daddy was a high-functioning alcoholic who was verbally abusive to Mother whether he was drinking or not. We walked on eggshells, never knowing when Dad was going to have an outburst of rage or be mean-spirited to my brother, Mom, or me. Mealtimes were not fun very unpredictable emotionally, which may have some effect upon my wavering food addiction and my lack of desire to sitting down to any family or social gathering, even to this day. Mom was a classic codependent wife and mother who kept the peace as much as possible. She grew up with an alcohol father, alcoholic father and brother, so she had lots of experience. She taught us early on that dad's good name and reputation were to be protected at all costs. Rita is with us today. She's sharing her story. She's much more comfortable reading it. You're a good reader, by the way. Thank you. And so we're going to uh, ask her to do that, and then later on you can call in and we'll ask her some questions about her story. We're live here on Restoring Hope Live, brought to you by Powell CDC on The Truth 99.3. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can give these grandkids back, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We can help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi, my name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, because I've been there. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, Everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live.
Welcome back. Welcome back to Max World Live. This is Bob Montserrat, Cat in Hat. And we're going to continue with our guest, Rita, Rita Hopper, who is telling us her uh, story. And, and so far, it's been very interesting. So, Rita, would you like to continue? Yes, I would. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, in our home, we were always to behave in a manner that would not draw attention to ourselves or tarnish our family name. I lived with emotional, physical abuse from my brother, who was acting out in his own way to dad's verbal abuse. He was passive aggressive and became a mini version of dad before he was 10 or 12 years old. He was very manipulating, controlling of me, and I feared him from an early age. I learned to stay out of his way unless we were thrown together in the back seat of a car going to a family gathering. The main request from my mom as I grew up was to be good and not cause any problems because she had enough to deal with keeping the family secrets and the peace of her two men in the family. So I learned early on how to become a chameleon, adapting to whoever and whatever my mom, friends, teachers, and authority figures required me to become. Their needs always came before my own needs or desires. I was considered a good kid and never was a problem, even as a teen. No drinking, smoking, drugs, sexual escapades, because I had to protect my father's reputation. That is codependence, my friends. I loved school, was a teacher's pet, very empathetic and kind to my friends, and I related very well to most adults, better than I did to kids my age. I was very active in 4-H for horses, church choir, youth activities, theater and service projects to the community. Church and school, though, were my safe places, and I was always disappointed when summer came. My teen years were also filled with confusion and turmoil, with sexual abuse from my grandpa, my 4-H leader, and a youth group leader. I figured that this was normal and felt shame for being too vulnerable and needy by wanting their approval. Shame, guilt, and a negative self-image made up my identity. I literally feared my dad and was thankful for the long hours that he worked as well as my parents' active social life at night. I felt very safe one-on-one with my mom, but overall, home was not a safe place for me. The lack of boundaries and codependence at home kept my stomach constantly agitated, and I felt very lonely. Even in a large crew of people, I always felt lonely. God always had a hand in my survival, though. He helped my dad take pity on his horse-loving daughter and bought me a horse when I was 13. I spent my junior high and high school years in 4-H, horse shows, rodeos, and trail rides. I would spend eight hours a day in the summer riding on my horse. I was passionate about riding, and I truly believed that my sanity, emotionally speaking, was found in the bond I had with my horse. He was my greatest confidant, listened to my tearful stories, and gave me unconditional love that only an animal can give. I don't judge or laugh at anyone who says that their pet is their best friend. My fast ho- last horse, Sonny, was the only friend who knew everything bad in my life. I couldn't tell anybody else. I consider him truly uh, human. Having always gone to church camp and Sunday school, I had a commitment to God, but I never accepted Jesus as my Savior. Just a week before graduation, I accepted Christ as my Savior at a youth rally in a park. The 70s was a time of free love, hippies, Woodstock, rap group, and Jesus freaks. I became accepted into a group of people that loved me unconditionally and prayed for me daily. My hunger and thirst for God's word was insatiable, and I couldn't get enough of the Bible. The verse that resonated in my life for several years was Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. That began a lifelong passion for theology, Bible history, Christian nonfiction and fiction. Books have always been a source of joy, safety, and adventure. My husband calls me a voracious reader, sometimes reading a book a day. Hmm. I went to the University of South Dakota for two years, worked for a few years in Minneapolis, then was introduced to a small Bible college called Venard, which is located in University Park, Iowa. I became a Christian education major and fell in love with my husband, Richard, of 38 years. He was studying to be a pastor, so we finished school and spent the next 17 years in California, Missouri, Illinois, and settled in Iowa. I vowed that I would never marry someone like my father, and I didn't. I married a godly, compassionate, gentle giant of a man, and we had two daughters, and in 1980 and Katie in 1985, which was truly awesome because I truly believe that every adopted kid wonders if they can have kids. Bless their hearts, they were PKs, pastor's kids, and practically lived at the church. I taught in a Christian school for a few years in California, 
while Rich was interning, and look back on those years as really special, an honor to be part of the children's lives. Today and always, my daughters are my pride and joy, and they have blessed us with four precious, mischievous, gorgeous grandkids. Unfortunately, it was at that time after we moved to Des Moines in 1987 that I began to have times of rage, being verbally abusive to my husband, being manipulative and controlling of him and my kids. I went from a kind, well-liked woman to a force to be reckoned with in just a matter of a few years. I didn't know why or how my personality to my husband and daughters changed. I maintained an outgoing, positive jack, jack of all trades, pastor's wife persona, directing adult children's choirs, directing two church musicals a year, playing the piano, singing on the worship team, children's director, youth director, Sunday school teacher, you name it, I did it. It's not unusual for a pastor's wife to do a lot of things, especially in the small churches that we pastored in a really very small conservative denomination. However, I became controlling, manip manipulative, verbally abusive to those that I worked with at the church, mainly by sarcasm and a lot of dry humor. I thought I was indispensable, the only one who could do anything right at church and at home, but especially at home. You see, I didn't marry a man like my father. I became my father. Not by drinking or drugs, mind you, because my verbal and emotional abuse didn't need any chemicals to alter my behavior from congenial to downright nasty. I was a pleasant, outgoing, compassionate person at work, but at home I was never satisfied. I was critical, angry, sarcastic, and negative to my girls and husband. After many years of that behavior, I realized that I was not a very nice person. I communicated by instilling fear within my girls. I wanted them to be seen and not heard, like my parents had wanted of me. I was judgmental, critical, domineering, self-seeking, but could also charm. I was a mon wonderful manager at my job, outgoing and friendly. However, I started to lose sight of who I was, or maybe I recognized that I didn't know who I had become or why. I became depressed, isolated, dreading family time, sick frequently with stomach issues. And I adopted the proverbial, if mama ain't happy, no one is. God put us in the right church at the right time and the right job to allow me to seek counseling from the senior pastor of our church. I was approaching my 50th birthday and realized that my husband feared me, never talked to me unless he had to. I made my girls walk on eggshells. They never knew what was going to come out of my mouth, sweetness or bitterness. In my search for answers, I came across these verses in James that spoke directly to me about my behavior and what was acceptable in God's eyes. James 3, 1 through 12 says, We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we could turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. All they are so, although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes cursing and praising. My brothers and sisters, this shouldn't be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. I had a deadly tongue, full of restless evil, full of deadly poison. I was praising God and verbally abusing others. God says that it should not be out of the same mouth that comes cursing and praising. There would not be any fruit as long as I was poisoning it with my mouth, thoughts, and behaviors. I could not expect it to be used by God to reach others if I was speaking kindness out of one side of my mouth and bitterness and verbal abuse out of the other side. That, my friends, is hypocritical. It's not biblical. I sought out counseling from our senior pastor who promised me that if I got to an area of concern that he wasn't professionally equipped to help me, 
that it was beyond his knowledge and understanding, he would refer me to a therapist. As I listed areas in my life that I wanted to change, the list got longer and longer. The negative behavior far outweighed any positive behavior. We started peeling off layers of the onion, so to speak. I realized it was not normal to have been inappropriately touched by your grandfather, your 4-H trail route reader, your director of lay ministry, past boyfriends. See, I thought I had handled that. Men were just going to be that way. As long as I could control it, it was fine. No, far from the truth. There was a monster at the bottom of the pit that had yet to be uncovered and dealt with. My lowest point was in May of 2003. My mother had passed away in August of 2001 of leukemia and Parkinson's disease. That had left me to care for my father, who was living seven hours away from me. My brother lived in Texas, so every two years, every two weeks for two years, I drove to South Dakota to find my dad in various degrees of drunkenness and lack of self-care. He wasn't paying bills and garbage was all over the house. I would get him food, leave him in a state of semi-soberness, pay his bills and go back home. I was his only contact because he isolated himself and was slowly drinking himself into the grave. I had him winter in a local nursing home, but he was always home after three weeks because he was thirsty, an insanity cycle. But he had no acknowledgement on his part. Mom had controlled that area for him, made excuses for him, been his fixer of embarrassing messes. She was gone, he fell apart. Not from grief as much as from not knowing when he had his last drink because he was drunk or passed out every day. His siblings trying to help him, but he pushed them away. I was his daughter, and it was my responsibility to care for him, still protecting his image. Trying to reason with him, but alcohol was the best friend, and he became more belligerent and mean. In May of that year, during a personal time of worship at my church where I'd been praying, excuse me. That's all right, just take your time. Rita is looking <clears throat> between or with her sheets as she has, uh, uh, I think, eight sheets uh, back in front, and she's sharing her story with us today, her testimony. Uh, by reading it, which makes her much more comfortable. And uh, we'll get an opportunity to ask questions a little later. Uh, should there be any, I would tell you at this point, I think she's done an excellent job of reading. I'm sorry, let's back up. She's done an excellent job of writing her testimony in a way that it can be very easily uh, read and delivered. And uh, I don't know if anybody ever told you this, Rita, but you read real well. I even had a listener say that uh, on the uh, on the website. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to okay. take a break. Sure. And when we come back, Rita will continue to share her story with us. Very well written, very well spoken. And we'll get that opportunity to hear that later. Do want to remind you, it's the second day of November, and that means Steve Dace is back. For some of you, that's good. For the others, well, we know. We know how you feel. He's live tonight, 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock, here exclusively on 99.3 uh, KTIA, which is the truth. And this is a radio station. Have you just, uh, in case you just found it, we've only been on the air uh, here in the Des Moines market for about four months. Previously, we had a 20-year history in Boone. The Federal Communication Commission allowed us to move into Des Moines, and we're very happy to be here. We are the truth. And I think you'll find that most of the time, you'll agree right here on 99.3 The Truth. I'm J. Michael McCoy. We're coming back. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershide. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us, 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, 
it's still a fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are going to give you an exact to the penny price on what it's going to take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile? That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. <laughs> we have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're gonna make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. The 22 minutes before the top of the hour, Salem Radio Network News. And then Hank, the Bible Answer Man, one 888 1-888-ASK-HANK. Uh, now would be a good time to call in if you've got a question for Hank, as the phone lines do get a little stacked. But he's live. Here in Des Moines, Iowa, every day from 5 to 6, right after Max World Live. Steve Dace tonight, 8 to 11, and now we return to Restoring Hope Live with my special guest, Rita, who has asked if she could read her testimony, and then we could ask some questions later. Uh, and so, Rita, I'll let you continue. In May of 2003, during a personal time of worship at church where I had been praying, I was seeking God for answers. I desperately wanted the truth. God's word in John 8, 32 says, and you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. I wanted that freedom, even if it meant that the freedom was gonna devastate me. God answered in love. And I began to have flashbacks of sexual abuse from my father, beatings from my brother. I remember crying out to God, oh no, don't let it be, please don't let it be. But all the pieces started falling together. I knew that I was the way I was because I hadn't known all of the truth. The reality was that God had sex, that dad had sexually and emotionally abused me from three years old to around 19 years of age. I had disassociated and stuffed it down deep. God had protected my child's mind by allowing me to not bear more than I could handle. While at church that night, I had a psychotic breakdown. I managed to contact my pastor and husband before totally spacing out. My pastor's Trauma training was put to good use that night as he taught me back from flashback after flashback for over three hours. I was referred to a Christian counselor immediately, as well as continued extensive spiritual counseling with my pastor. My husband and kids saw me go from this strong, opinionated, caustic woman to an empty shell, fearful, lots of PTSD, helpless. I began therapy within two days only not going into the hospital as I probably should have because my youngest daughter was graduating in two weeks from high school and I wanted to be there. I had her party planned. People all over were coming. My dad and aunts and uncles were coming. So an action plan was formulated for the entire weekend with strong support from my pastor, my husband, my therapist. My girls didn't know anything at that time. I wanted to make it through that and then just let go and start really dealing with the horror. And I made it, but afterwards I didn't see my dad or my brother, any dad, any family on my dad's side for over 18 months. My brother had to take over caring for my dad because it wasn't safe for me mentally, physically to be anywhere near him. 
much less care for his needs when I was dealing with all those fresh memories. My brother did, but it created a huge rift and a lot of condemnation from him and dad's siblings. Dad was the eldest and big brother could do no wrong. They would not believe the truth and I was ostracized. Probably the best thing that ever came out of that. You see, the family had been full of secrets for years, full of denial, and they were experts at wearing the proper masks of kindness and wisdoms. I didn't have to anymore. My confusing, dysfunctional life made sense for, to me for the first time in 49 years. I was able to begin the process of healing. It got so intense that I quit my management job so that I could really work on my therapy. Our income was cut in half. My husband said, it's okay, quit. I want you to heal. I was unable to function to work and with the help of meds was finally sleeping for the first time in 45 years. Insomnia had always been an issue for me because a lot of the abuse happened at night and early morning. After five years of awesome spiritual support from my husband, pastor, my therapist, a psychiatrist, I was on the road to healing. God literally rose me up from the ashes, forming a new creation in him, helping me to discover who I was and how all my past could be used for his glory. It was long, it was hard, it was eye-opening, it was self-discovery. With Christ's help, I became a healing in process. I was diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder, PTSD, severe depression, and I'm still on meds to help regulate that. This verse has become a reality to me, found in Isaiah 43, 1 through 3. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the holy God of Israel, your Savior. In 2013, my husband lost his job. I was isolating and come to a place that only wanted to spend time with God, nobody else. I retreated to my bedroom for days and knew that I didn't want to live the rest of my life that way. So during the six weeks that Rich was out of work, we came to celebrate recovery, starting in October 2013 at Lutheran Church of Hope. I probably wouldn't have walked through the doors alone because I could rationalize anything, any way, so that I wouldn't have to get out of my isolation. But God, in his divine plan of recovery for me, allowed my husband to come with me for six weeks. We had heard of Celebrate Recovery several years ago and witnessed the changed lives of some of those who had attended at Lutheran Church of Hope and other churches in the area. Our home church didn't have a program, so God led us there. When I walked through those doors, I immediately felt an equality with those who Celebrate Recovery that I'd never found before. Like when you ask Jesus into your life and you have this bond with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, I felt that bond with the women in my small group of sexual, emotional, physical abuse. Someone knew exactly what I had been through. All the sisters were in varying degrees of recovery, but I saw hope at the end of the tunnel. I cried the first six months at every meeting when I shared. I hadn't ever shared my abuse with other women. I went from a place of isolation to community. I waited for the first available step study and signed up, and that was 18 months ago. I now have a wonderful group of steady step study sisters who hold me accountable and allow me to love them just as they are by just the way that I am. The step study changed my life because it helped me to see what hang-ups, heartaches, and habits were keeping me in bondage from being authentic and real, being authentic, vulnerable, and courageous. Coming along other side women as they walk with their recovery journey has been an honor for me, and it's life-changing. Principle four touched my heart the most because I had to face my past by doing my inventory, and confessing it to my sponsor. It gave me a freedom from my burden that I was lugging around for years. I was able to have a fresh start, a clean slate by confessing and then making amends. I have forever friends that I know that I can count on holding me accountable. I'm seeing others through Christ's eyes of love and acceptance now instead of mine. Daily quiet time of prayer is now focused on daily inventory, making amends if needed, and letting go of what I can't control. I am no longer dwelling on the past and how it damaged me, but now focusing on the freedom that I've gained in Christ. 
God has given me an opportunity to live my life in joy, not regret, to strive to live the celebrate recovery lifestyle daily, to purpose to come alongside of others in their recovery journey. I learned that recovery takes time. I learned to give myself permission to take two steps forward and four steps backward, to get up each new day with a fresh start, no longer having to hold on to the past. The three benefits that I received from working the program were first, community, no more isolation. I have new friends now through brokenness and by being authentic. Two, purpose, walking alongside others through their recovery journey. And three, wholeness, keeping my mind on Christ, being filled daily with his spirit and taking care of myself. Having completed my step study, I'm now one of the small group leaders for the physical, sexual, and emotional abuse for women. I have the pleasure to be a sponsor to several women who are beginning their recovery journey. It's my joy to come alongside of them, not to fix them, but to watch Christ make them new in his time, in his way, by his spirit. I helped to start the Celebrate Recovery recently at our home church, New Hope Assembly of God in Urbandale. I am, and my husband are worship leaders there, and I help lead a step study there. Today, my identity is not my past. My identity is in Christ. I am his child, first and foremost. I thank God for all the pain I've gone through so that I can claim that truth, that Christ alone is my identity. My isolation has gone to community and now service. My self-condemnation and poor self-image are now under Christ's blood. I'm learning daily what's unhealthy, turning from that with Christ's help and developing new healthy relationships for the first time in my adult life. I have made amends to my husband and daughters, and it's taken me a while. We are going to hear the end of Rita's incredible story when we come back, right here on The Truth. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi. My name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, as I've been there. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Ten minutes before the top of the hour, Salem Radio Network News, and then ask, uh, wait, I'm sorry, Hank, the Bible Answer Man, and you can call in and ask Hank any question you want about the Bible, Old or New Testament, it doesn't matter. He's at one eight eight eight. Ask Hank. One eight eight eight. Ask Hank. We're here today for Restoring Hope Live, brought to you by Powell CDC, and a lovely young lady by the name of Rita has been sharing her testimony with us. And we're coming uh, to a present time, and uh, it all being wrapped up uh, as Jesus would want it to be. So, so Rita, I'll let you finish your uh, testimony with us, please. Thank you. The recovery lifestyle has changed my outlook on life and given me a purpose for the present and the future. God is beginning to heal my extended family relationships. 
I was able to spend the last years of my daddy's life having forgiven him. By that time, he had dementia and wouldn't have understood any kind of confrontation. He became a gentle, kind, compassionate person who lived and served others in a nursing home until he died at 87 years of age. He truly gave of himself with unconditional love and acceptance for me for who I was. I was privileged to be able to love him the way I'd always wanted to. It took 57 years, but it was worth it. He had the opportunity to confess his sins and make amends to those he hurt as much as he was able. I have full confidence that I'll see him and mom when I go to heaven. I don't understand God's forgiveness, but I do know that Jesus died for every woman and man, those who abuse and those who have been abused. He forgives those who ask for it and washes them white as snow. I don't know how or why he does that. That's not my job. It's God's. My story may not be your story or how your recovery unfolds, and that's okay. God made us individually and will heal us individually. No two recoveries are the same because he created us uniquely special. However, I know that because of Celebrate Recovery and living it as a lifestyle each day, I can choose to live that day with truth, honesty, and by his spirit and strength. I'll never be strong enough on my own. I need to allow myself to be human, frail, make mistakes, own up to those mistakes, ask forgiveness, change my playgrounds and playmates if I have to, so that they are living the same kind of lifestyle I am. My new life verse is this, Isaiah 118, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Well, Rita, uh, that was a wonderful story. You're a good reader and as well as a good writer. Uh, I think you quoted three Bible verses, James 3, 1 through 12, Isaiah 43, 1 through something, that I didn't get that, and then Isaiah 1 and 18. Mm-hmm. Uh, I appreciate that you uh, bringing those Bible verses into that. I have a couple questions. Frank, I know you do, too. Go ahead. Well, just quickly, just more of a comment. Uh, I, you know, I, I appreciate you mentioning uh, forgiveness, and particularly when it comes to your father. You notice when it says, honor your mother and father, that your days shall be long. It doesn't say honor your mother and father except if he did or except if he didn't. We're required to love and honor our parents irregardless so I appreciate your comments about uh, the forgiveness aspect of uh, what went on in your life. It took a long time. Um, I, I never really mourned my mother because I had to care for my father right away. And I found out I was angrier at her uh, for not watching out for me, even though she was a hawk. But, um, yeah, it didn't make any sense. Forgiveness is about freedom, freedom in your own heart. Not about forgetting what they did, but so that you can go forward with freedom. You said at the end of your story that you and your father died at peace with each other. Um, If he had not had Alzheimer's and uh, had basically lost his mind, Mm -hmm. uh, I mean that in a nice way. (laughs) Do you think you would have confronted him in a loving, gentle way? Yes, yes. And... And you're at peace with that. Yes. I, I did confront him, actually, to be honest with you. Okay. Uh, but I wasn't able to do it when he was alive. Mm. Um, I did it therapeutically when he was in his casket. And after a wake time, I asked the young man who I'd grown up riding horses with. I, don't, I think I scared the bejeebers out of him. But I asked him if I could have a few moments. And then I told, I laid into him. I told him what he had stolen from me. And what he had done and how he had also hurt my daughters. And in the same voice was, I love you, I love you, I hate you, I hate you. So that really made a difference for me. But if he had been alive, yes. Would daddy have actually recognized that he'd done anything wrong? No. But he did say to me several times in those last years, you know, honey, if I've ever done anything to hurt you, I'm really sorry. And that was good enough for me. Russ? Uh, I got here at the tail end, uh, you're talking about forgiveness. How do you, uh, answer, uh, somebody who professes to be Christian? And I know, uh, Christians, uh, know the Holy Spirit, but I know the Holy Spirit doesn't know. No, I, 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 it's just the other way around. 
the Holy Spirit knows all Christians, but not all Christians know the Holy Spirit. So what I'm getting at is if somebody says, yeah, I'm a Christian, but they can't forgive their own brother or sister for 20, 25 years for something that the other kin doesn't even know what it's all about because they won't ever talk about it. How do, you, uh, how do you approach somebody that says, I'm a Christian, but they can't forgive others? You know, it's okay. It, they need to do it in their own time and in their own way. Um, they need to come. They can carry those chains around and that bondage the rest of their lives, but they'll never truly be able to feel the joy and the freedom. So I, I purport that people who have been abused need to do it in their own time. They need to do it the way that works out for them. And if they don't feel they can, uh, I have prayed this prayer many times. God, make me willing to be willing to be willing. Mm. And maybe that will be all they'll get to. And that's okay. You, uh, you speak of Celebrate Recovery as really the platform, uh, the safe house, the curriculum that has brought you to such a peaceful place in your life. Have you asked God why it took him so long to bring you there? No. Uh, I know that I was the one that was in the way. Okay. I, I had a wonderful time of fellowship with Christ on my own, but I was not reaching out. I was, I was like, I was filled up and overflowing, but never reaching to others. And so scared that somebody else wouldn't understand. So I, I don't feel that it took God a long time. I think it took me a long time okay. to get to a place of being broken. And now, authenticity and being genuine and being vulnerable, that's called wholehearted living to me. And I want to do that until the day Jesus takes me home. Well, Rita, thank you very much for um, being here today and sharing your story. I've never allowed uh, someone to read, but I just felt the Spirit telling me that that's what we should do with you, and it was spectacular. Thank you I'm very so much. I'm so very, very glad that we did it that way. It's a pleasure being here. Yeah. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for being here. All right, as I always do, seems very apropos with today's story, but if you've got somebody out there you need to forgive, would you please forgive them tonight? Because as you forgive, remember, you shall be forgiven. I'll see you in church. <laughs>